All right, so today you're going to look at all the things you need to know in terms of practical application of physics to cars. We'll look at GPS navigation, then we will look at stopping distances and safety features of cars for when you don't manage to stop in time. And then we'll finish up with some equilibrium. We'll look at forces and equilibrium and moments. Okay, let's get started. GPS. Satellite navigation. So the, the GPS system consists of 32 satellites in orbit. So it's, a, it's, we call it orbit, it's called a constellation of satellites. And the method that GPS uses to locate either the car with the GPS receiver in it, or you, so you can get them for walking, biking, smartphones have GPS receivers often as well. Uh, the method is called trilateration. And what the satellites do is they broadcast a message with a time stamp in the message. And that allows the receiver a way of calculating the time that it took for the message to travel from the satellite to the receiver. Now, the satellites are in a regular orbit, so you know where the satellites are located. It's a regular orbit, and you can therefore predict where the satellite is going to be. You need a minimum of three satellites in order to use tri trilateration. In reality, you, you actually use four, because using three satellites, you can actually narrow down your position to two positions. Now, you can still get away with that, because one of those positions will be up in space somewhere. So, therefore, you know you're the one that is not up in space. But usually four are actually used. Because you know the time that it's taken the message to travel between a known location and the receiver, and the velocity of the message is also known, you're using radio waves, so we know how fast radio waves travel. Therefore, you can work out the distance between the receiver and the satellite. Now, what I'm going to do is use just the three satellites to illustrate what happens. The, the, knowing your distance from the first satellite can put you anywhere on the surface of a sphere. So that is the satellite, and you know that you're a distance away, which would be the radius of this sphere. So you could be anywhere on the surface area of a sphere. Now that's an incredible number of possibilities. So what we do then is bring in another satellite, the distance between us and that satellite. Again, we know the location, so therefore we can narrow down the number of possibilities. Instead of being on the surface area of the sphere, we're where, where, wherever the two spheres that we could possibly be on, we're where they intersect. And their intersection is the perimeter of a circle. If you imagine two spheres merging into each other, then where they're crossing over actually forms the perimeter of a circle. Again, there's still a lot of possibilities there, but we have narrowed it down. So, bring in a third satellite, and the intersection of those three surface areas of the spheres will give you a point. In reality, it actually gives you two points, depending on the arrangement, but you, you can, as we explained before, if you have four satellites, you can get yourself down to one position, especially if you want to know your altitude. So that's uh, GPS. Next, car stopping distances. There are two aspects to a stopping distance. The first one is your thinking distance. Now this, take, this is the distance that the car travels whilst the driver is reacting to a hazard. And during the reaction time, nothing has changed about the car's motion. The driver still has their foot on the throttle just as they did uh, when they saw the hazard. So they continue travelling at constant velocity. The second one, the braking distance, that's the distance between applying the brakes and coming to a stop. And that type of motion, you're decelerating. The total 
stopping distance is the sum of those two components. So here's our car. Now, the, at this, the car's been travelling along and it sees a hazard. Knows the driver now and appreciates that they have to stop. The car continues to travel at constant velocity, covering the thinking distance. So that's the first component. After that time, they, the driver has reacted and put their foot on the brakes. And then during this time here, they're slowing down, they're decelerating. So this is the braking distance. Let's look at, and some of it is the stopping distance. Let's look at this as a graph, a velocity time graph. We've covered those before for car stopping. VT, we start at U. This is your thinking time, I suppose, because it's a time axis, and this is your decelerating time. And this is where you continue at constant velocity, so you enter at u and you end at u. What you use here is the constant velocity equation, s equals ut, and then you start to decelerate, and we always assume it's a constant deceleration, so we use SUBAT equations during this really time here. And always appreciate that your final velocity, if you manage to stop, is zero. So that gives you one of the conditions for the SUBAT equation. Okay. Often, when you're dealing with stopping distances, you have to incorporate SUBAT equations and F equals MA, because you may need to find a braking force, given that you know the final velocity, the initial velocity, the time over which they are braking, and so on. Use that to find out the deceleration and then work out the braking force. So let's do an example calculation. We've got a car, mass 950 kilograms, travelling at 40 miles an hour. I've given a conversion factor for miles per hour to kilometres per hour. One mile per hour is 1.6 kilometres per hour. The way I always remember this is uh, as a fraction, 8 over 5, because that means working out things in your head is easier. Well, I find it easier anyway. They see a pedestrian step out to the road, and the, there's 50 metres between the driver at that time and the pedestrian. The driver has a reaction time of 0.23 seconds, and the car has a constant braking force of 3.5 kilonewtons. Calculate whether the car had enough distance to stop. First thing we need to do is to convert our initial velocity into SI units, because we've got it in miles per hour. So to convert, firstly, the miles per hour into kilometers per hour, I multiply by 1.6, because one mile per hour is 1.6 km, so 40 times that. And then multiply by 1,000 so kilometres, 1,000 metres per hour. So I need to do per second, so divide by 3,600. That's 17.8 metres per second. Now I need to work out the thinking distance. So ST, meaning thinking distance, U times the reaction time that was given to me, 17.8 times 0.23. 4.09 metres. That's just thinking, of, that's just the brain processing the information, trying to send a signal to the foot to start braking. So we still have the braking distance to do. What we need to do at this stage is list our information for the deceleration aspect of the motion so we know which SUBAT equation to use. So the list of the information. The distance is what we want to find. I suppose I should have put SB there. The U is the same U over here because they stayed at that velocity throughout the reaction time, so now they're entering the braking distance with that velocity. V is zero because we want to find out when they came to a halt. And then for the acceleration, this is where we have to bring in F equals MA. And you notice I've used a negative value here because it's a deceleration. The force is in the opposite direction to the motion, so I'm using negatives here. F over M. Now, it's 3,500, though, because it's kilonewtons. 
over the mass 950 kg. So that gives me 3.68 meters per second squared. Don't need to know the time. So I've got four quantities. The equation that I'd use is V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. Rearrange it. So the distance is V squared minus U squared over 2A. This is going to give me a negative term here because U, V sorry, is 0 and U is not 0. It's the larger value, so that's going to give me a negative there. And the 2A is negative. Let's work that out. 43.1 metres. Stopping distance then is the sum of both of those, giving me 47.2. Don't just state your answer because it said determine whether the car had enough distance to stop. The answer to the question is yes. They've got about 2.8 metres between them and the pedestrian. So they did manage to stop in time. Okay, any questions about that calculation? Yeah, the last bit. I was confused. This bit here? Oh, the explanation. Yeah. So the pedestrian stepped to, into the road 50 metres ahead of the car. Mm -hmm. So there's 50 metres between the car and the pedestrian. Mm -hmm. And 47.2 is less than 50. So that meant the car stopped before it reached the pedestrian, which is good. All right. There are factors that affect your stopping distance, and they may affect different aspects of the stopping distance. Thinking distance, factors that affect that, initial velocity and the driver's reaction time. Then braking distance, the initial velocity, vehicle mass, tyre tread if it's wet, brake condition, road conditions and the gradient of the road. So the gradient is whether it's the road is sloping upwards or downwards. Thinking distance factors then. If a car is travelling at a faster velocity, that will mean that they have a longer thinking distance because using S equals UT, S is proportional to U for, for the reaction time being the same. So same driver, same reaction time, you will have a longer thinking distance because you have more ground as a result of travelling faster. If you've got a drunk driver, then they have a longer reaction time, so therefore you have a longer thinking distance because S is proportional to T for a constant velocity, for the same velocity graph. This is not a factor that affects it. Wet road conditions, they don't affect your thinking distance. Because you're driving according to the conditions and you're continuing to, to at that velocity whether the road is wet or not. And also whether the road is inclined upwards or downwards, that has no effect on the thinking distance either. Because you're controlling your velocity to be at constant velocity. We assume that the driver was driving at constant velocity. All right, so thinking distance conditions. Braking distance conditions. If you travel at a faster velocity, then you get a longer braking distance. If I use this equation, which is the one we just used actually, then S is proportional to U squared if you have a constant deceleration, or the same deceleration in two cases. What that tells you is that the braking distance is profoundly affected by your initial velocity because it's proportional to the velocity squared. So if you double your initial velocity, then your braking distance will quadruple. Drunk driver, longer reaction time, but no effect on the braking distance. Your reaction time doesn't affect the, your ability to brake unless you are absolutely paralytically drunk. Say that. You need to be drunk, basically. Sorry? You need to be drunk. Yeah. Basically, you can't feel well in it. Like, your muscles go like blunt. They, they, possibly, but it. But it's, like, we're, just, we're just looking at being. The drunk, a bit, bit tipsy, I guess, you know, someone who thinks they can still drive. I mean, if you're, if you're all floppy, if you're that drunk, you probably couldn't get in the car, let alone drive it. So we're just saying it's affected their reaction time. It doesn't actually affect the braking distance. You can, 
under those conditions you can still put your foot on as good as the cosmic because some car are like the hard brake. Yeah. yeah, so that would be a different effect. If you have wet road conditions, then the friction between the tyre and the road that's reduced, so you get a smaller deceleration in that case to get a longer braking distance. S is proportional to 1 over A, and looking at that. The road inclined upwards, two ways you can go about explaining this actually. So the first one, if, you, if the road is inclined upwards, then there's a component of the way which acts against the motion that's down the slope. Therefore, you get a larger braking force, and that would be a shorter braking distance. That's basically intuitive if you're going up. You would expect to eventually stop anyway. And then the other aspect is using energy. Some of the kinetic energy of the car is converted into gravitational potential energy as it goes up. So there's less energy that needs to be turned into heat, which is what is happening when you brake. All right. Car safety features. The aim with your car safety features is to reduce the pressure on the driver and the passengers. You do that by reducing the forces of impact and or by increasing the area of contact. That's how you reduce the pressure on the driver. And you use three devices, or well, there's three that you need to know about anyway. Seatbelt, Airbag, compenser. Before we look at each one in turn, just want you to understand what would happen if you didn't have those safety features. When, during a collision, the car will come to rest very quickly, it experiences a very large deceleration. But the driver, in the absence of any safety features like a seatbelt, will continue to move forward at constant velocity. They're then going to strike the dashboard, or the steering wheel, or even the windscreen, and experience a large force because of this very short time. When, when a driver crashes into the steering wheel, or the dashboard, or whatever it may be, they will come to rest very quickly. So because of that short time of impact, they experience a large force due to the large deceleration. And therefore, they, there's a large pressure on them that causes damage to the body. So that's what would happen if you didn't have the safety features. So let's look at each one in turn. We've got seatbelts first. Now, the first thing you can say about seatbelt is that it provides a restraining force. A restraining force is one that prevents the driver from moving forward so that they then don't go on to hit the dashboard or the windscreen or the steering wheel. Uh, the way that they do that is the seatbelts have a ratchet in them which suddenly locks the seatbelt when it, there's a sudden jerking motion on the seatbelt. So I don't know if you've ever experienced, you put the seatbelt on then you do it a little bit too fast and it locks. You ever experienced that? So that's what's happening. The ratchet has locked because of that sudden change in motion of the, uh, the ratchet. So that's what happens to provide a restraining force. When it does provide that restraining force, it's also designed to stretch slightly. So you're increasing the time of impact, because now instead of impacting the dashboard, they're impacting the seatbelt, and you're trying to make that length of impact longer. So then, because your deceleration is proportional to one over time, by making the time longer, the deceleration is reduced and that reduces the force. Also, large surface area. So you have a seat belt around your waist and across the body so that you're increasing the area of contact. Like you make the seat belt not just like a thin rope, which would do the job, it would provide a restraining force, but it's still gonna cause damage due to the high pressure. So make it wide, and cover quite a lot of the body to increase the area and reduce the pressure. That's your seat belts. Airbags. Now, airbags, they only work 
if used in conjunction with a seatbelt. So if you have an airbag in your car, most cars do have airbags these days, you need to make sure you wear your seatbelt at the same time. What happens here is that the inflation of the airbag is triggered by a large deceleration. So you need to be familiar with uh, the triggering mechanism. And when I say a large deceleration, I mean a collision, usually. So it is possible to trigger the airbags by braking extremely hard in some cases. So the triggering mechanism is located here. This is the, the front of the car in this direction. There's a mass here on a spring. And if the deceleration is large, this mass will continue to move forward whilst the body has kind of slowed down a lot. And it will make contact with this accelerometer contact. That completes the circuit, allowing a spark to jump across the spark gap. That ignites your chemical mixture. These are chemicals which produce gas very, very fast. So you've got an explosion that takes place in the bag. The bag explodes out of the steering wheel. So you've got this nice big cushion for the driver to hit into. The, the airbag is perforated so that when the driver does make contact with the airbag, it instantly begins to deflate slightly because you want the driver not to hit this big solid cushion that they bounce off of because you haven't done them any favours by doing that. You want it to deflate slightly so that they continue moving forward but it slows them down. And an airbag is designed to reduce whiplash and neck injury. Because if you just have a seatbelt, you'll still lurch forward and your, your head is not shamed by, by a seatbelt so your head continues to move forward and that can put a lot of strain on your neck. And it has a large surface area so it reduces pressure. That's your airbag. It's much, much better to land on the airbag which has got that large surface area rather than the, seat, the steering wheel or dashboard. Then crumple zones. The crumple zone is de designed to uh, crumple in a, or deform rather, in a controlled manner. So the front of the car here, this region here, is designed to crumple on impact to absorb energy from the collision. So you can see this, this uh, representation of a car has crum crumpled where it's made contact with that wall there. So it's that front portion of the car. And what it does is it prevents intrusion of the components of the car, and particularly the engine, from protruding into where the passengers are located. And this increases the time of impact by slowing, by lengthening the time of impact, you reduce the forces of impact. So the deceleration again proportional to one over time. Okay. So those are the aspects, the practical aspects as applied to cars that we needed to cover. Now we're on to equilibrium. And there are two conditions for equilibrium. First up, there must be zero resultant force, and that gives you no linear acceleration. Then you need to have zero net moment about any point of the object, and that gives you zero rotational acceleration. And objects at rest, constant velocity, are in equilibrium. I put in there constant angular momentum, but that's just for completeness, not something you need to know about at this stage. So those objects, they are at equilibrium. Firstly, let's look at the first condition, zero result force. I mean, a lot of this you'll be familiar with from the previous lectures. The vector sum of the forces must be zero. So in this case, this is an object at terminal velocity where the weight is equal to the drag, giving you zero resultant force. 
And therefore, when we say the object at terminal velocity is moving at constant velocity, we're saying it's at equilibrium. This object has got three forces acting on it, though, so you need to be aware of situations like that. And in the, if this is at equilibrium, the vector sum of the forces must be equal to zero. So you could say one way of looking at this problem is, and the, probably the simplest, is that the horizontal component of T must be equal to F because those are the only two forces that are acting in the horizontal plane. And the vertical component of T must be equal to the weight because those are the only two forces acting in the vertical plane. So you can use trigonometry if you know what T is to find out the horizontal and vertical components by itself for F or W. Or if you know F and W, you can use trigonometry to relate F to the horizontal component of T and so on. The other type of problem you get are objects on a slope. So the weight acts vertically downwards. Now, what's different here is here we had one force that was horizontal, one that was vertical. So it made sense to think of that problem in the horizontal and vertical planes by referencing the horizontal and vertical components of T. But in this situation, because you've got one force parallel to the slope and one perpendicular, so these two are at 90 degrees to each other, resolve W down to its component which is perpendicular to the slope and the component which is parallel to the slope. So that makes more sense in that case. If I show that there. This is the perpendicular component, that's the parallel component. And this angle here is equal to the angle of the slope from the horizontal. It's equal to theta. You can, there are two, two ways to solve it. The first one resolving I've already mentioned here, but you can also draw a triangle of forces as well. Because they're in equilibrium, the vector sum must be equal to zero. So if you draw all of these forces head to tail, so it'd be T, W, F, they should form a triangle. And in this case, they'll form a right angle triangle. And in this case, they should also form a right angle triangle, but it would be rotated slightly according to that angle there. So you've got two ways of solving the problem. That's the first condition. Second condition. Moments, and this is to do with the mo uh, the second condition is that the sum of the moments about any point are zero. But what are moments? So that's what we're looking at here. This is the rotational effect of forces. And the moment is equal to the force times the perpendicular distance between the force and the pivot. And the pivot just being the point about which you're taking your moments. If we take moments about here on this rod with force F acting there vertically upwards and the distance between the point about which we're taking moments, up, which we can sometimes call pivot, it, and the for, line of action of the force is X. Now, note that X is perpendicular to the line of action of force. The moment is force times X. This time we've got a force at an angle, theta, to the vertical. We take moments about at the end there. So if you knew this distance, then it would be force times x. But you can also work out the component of the force which is perpendicular to the rod. And if you knew this distance, which I've called x prime there, then your moment would be f cos theta times x prime. Note that these two x's, they're different. And whichever method you use in that case, you'd get the same answer. you get the same solution. Always, when working with moments, always choose your pivots wisely. Because by choosing your pivot, you can eliminate forces from your equations that you get. So, there's likely another force here, probably actually two more forces in the real situation. And if I take moments about here, any forces acting here 
will provide a zero moment about that point because the perpendicular distance between the line of action of the force and the pivot is zero. It doesn't matter which way the force is acting, it could be acting that way, that way, that way. If you take moments about there, the perpendicular distance will always be zero. Couples, not romantic couples, uh, two forces, they are equal in magnitude, they act in opposite directions, and there's a perpendicular separation between those forces. That's what a couple is. These only produce rotational acceleration, they don't produce a resultant force because they're equal and opposite. And the torque of a couple is the force of one multiplied by the perpendicular separation between the two of them. So if there's our, there's our rod, we've got two forces on it, so it would be F times that separation there. So you just take one of the forces. Because if you, it doesn't matter where you take the moments about, be the same. So if you take moments about here, you eliminate this, and then the moment is force times x fx. If you take moments about here, then the moment provided by this one would be force times a half x. But then you have this one as well, because you haven't eliminated that, so it's plus force times a half x. So that's force times x. So you're just summing up two halves of x. Couples. Okay, so th let's go back to the second condition of equilibrium. The sum of the moments about any point is equal to zero. So the sum of the anti-clockwise moments is equal to the sum of the clockwise moments. This we call the principle of moments. This following object, which I'll show you, is in equilibrium. So if I tell you it's in equilibrium, then you know the sum of the moments about any point is equal to zero. So there's our object. We're going to take moments about this point because then the moment provided by F1 around that point is zero. It's acting straight through that point, so it's zero. If we take moments about point one, then the sum of the anti-clockwise moments is equal to the sum of the clockwise moments because it's in equilibrium. So anti-clockwise moment is provided by F2, which is trying to rotate it this way. Okay, so this is anti-clockwise. And that distance there is x1 plus x2. So f2 times the sum of those gives us the anti-clockwise moment. And the clockwise moment is this force multiplied by this distance here, distance from the pivot to the line of action of the force, so it's w times x1. That gives me one equation then. And I would know a number of those terms, but I wouldn't know I wouldn't know all of them. There'd still be some unknowns there. So then I need to use the first condition of equilibrium to come up with a new equation, which I can use with that to solve for the unknown that I have. If I resolve then the sum of the forces acting upwards will be equal to the sum of the forces acting downwards. These two act upwards, so F1 plus F2 must be equal to W, the weight. So I have two equations, and I can use those to solve the problem. You can actually get a third equation as well. You can actually get a third and a fourth. You just take moments about another point. So if you take moments about here, then you eliminate F2 from your equation. If you take moments about here, then you eliminate W. It just depends which force you know, which forces you don't. So you just take moments about one of the ones you don't know, and therefore eliminate it from your equation. So that's the second condition. I've got an example calculation here for the principle of moments. This is like a, the boom of a crane. It's got a number of forces acting on it. It's got a reaction force here. I've actually drawn that incorrectly. I don't know if you've spotted it. But R needs to have a horizontal component because this, otherwise this is the only horizontal force and there's no way that could be in equilibrium. It would need to be acting at an angle from the vertical. Anyway, 
that side, <coughs> because I'm going to take moments about that, I'm going to eliminate it from the equation so it's not going to be a problem. We want to find what tension is required here to keep the load, which has a weight of 3,920 newtons, suspended on this crane. So it's going to be in equilibrium. <coughs> The weight of the boom is also given to us, it's 980 newtons, and we have these distances and the angle of the boom from the horizontal given to us. Right, first thing to do is find out the sum of the anti-clockwise moments. Now, the only force, by taking, um, as I said earlier, I'm taking moments about this point here, that way I eliminate R, which is uh, unknown to me. This is unknown, this is unknown, but I want to find this one, so I don't want to eliminate T. In order to do this, I'm going to have to use trigonometry because I don't know what this distance is here. So it's T times 12 sine 35, because this, is, this distance here would be the opposite if that's the hypotenuse. And that gives me 6.88 T. So I've got my anti-clockwise moments in terms of T. For the clockwise moments, note that the perpendicular distance for WL and W has been given to you. You wouldn't necessarily have this. You may have to use trigonometry given the length of the boom. So you could work out that if you didn't know it. But it has been given to me. So some of the clockwise moments, which is the moment provided by WL plus the moment provided by W, and that would be equal to now W, if it's uniform, which we're assuming it is, that's right in the middle of the boom, so therefore it's going to be right in the middle of this distance. So therefore W times 9.83 over 2, plus WL, this force, times by the full distance, that gives me 4,817 plus 3, 000, uh, sorry, 38,500, and that gives me 43.3 kN meters. So I'm using a prefix here. Okay, so I've got some of the clockwise, some of the anti clockwise. We apply the principle of moments, so those two terms are equal to each other. 6.88t is equal to 43.3. If you're not comfortable working with the prefix, then you can just write that down as 43,300. And so for kilonewton meters, T will be equal to 43.3 over 6.88, giving me 6.29 kilonewtons. That's the force in kilonewtons. If on the exam paper they've specified you've got to give it in newtons, then you can write it as. 6,290. Okay. A couple of practical applications of the principle of moments, or well, and moments in general. You can determine the centre of gravity of objects. The centre of gravity is the point through which the weight can be considered to act. If you've got a regular object, then the centre of gravity is at the geometric centre. So you've got a uniform cuboid, then the centre of gravity is right in the middle by drawing your diagonal lines where they cross. When you have irregular objects, what you need to do here is hang it from a point, which will then form a pivot, and allow it to come to rest. And then it's in equilibrium if it's at rest. So, this, so what would have happened in that case is by hanging it, you set up a couple, and that will accelerate the object until those two forces are perfectly in line. So we pivot it, we've got a reaction force at the pin, and we've got the weight there. That will then rotate so that then the lines of action of the forces are in one line. Having done that, you draw a dotted line below the pivot because you know the weight is now directly below where you pivoted it. And then you repeat that two more times, so you've got a total of three lines drawn from the vertex 
at each time, and where they cross, that's your centre of gravity. So that's how you determine the centre of gravity of an irregular object. And the, uh, the way that you get this line is you use a plumb line, so a plumb line will hang vertically. And then the last thing, the practical application, is the human forearm. So this is a schematic layout of the human forearm. You've got your bones there, you've got your elbow. Your bicep provides a force on the forearm. And there is actually a force here as well, due to the ligaments that attach bones. And the forearm has a weight itself, and then you have a load in your hand. So if we were to draw that as a vector diagram, then we'd have this. That's the reaction from the ligaments or pressure between the bones. Then you've got the tension provided by the biceps, the weight of the forearm, and the weight of the load. Then you have these distances between the elbow and those forces. Now, you take moments about here, therefore eliminating this reaction force, which you're unlikely to know in a given situation. Now, this distance here, x1, if we assume that the, the load here is the dominant one, as opposed to the weight of the forearm itself, so the weight of the forearm is not going to be much compared to someone down the gym lifting, doing some bicep curls. This distance here is, going to be, is proportionally much smaller than x3. So what that tells you is that this force needs to be much larger to that much larger than this force in order to keep that forearm horizontal. It needs to be much larger because the moments roughly have to be equal. If we just ignore this one, the moment provided by the biceps needs to be equal to the moment provided by the load. But because of this distance here being much larger, this force would have to be much larger. So you think, well, what's the, what's the point of that if your bicep has to do so much more work? Well, the advantage is that you can move your hand much f faster than the bicep has to move. So unless you wanted to have really long muscles, which are, you know, pivot, which are attaching up near your hand, which would be very odd, then this is a, this is a good situation. So it's a, a lever of what's happening here. This is, move, this is applying a much larger force, but it's not having to move as far. You know, how, how far does a bicep move when it contracts? Not very far. So you keep your muscles compact, but you can move your hands and your other limbs much further as a result of it. So that's moments, principle of moments. And that is the end for today. Has anyone got any questions we'd like to finish up?